You are now listening to Vigilantes Radio, the people's choice for quality art, interviews, music and hot topics. Hosted by Demetrius Houdini Black Reynolds and otherwise known as Danny Mussolini in the multi-universe. Call in to join the mix at 602-753-1654 or hop in via Skype. All episodes of this podcast are available for free download at www.onlyonemediagroup.com. We welcome all to submit material, topics and ideas. Email us at vradio at onlyonemediagroup.com. Enjoy the show. Okay, okay, yeah, I know those sound effects are real cheesy, but they gave me a bunch of real cool sound effects to play with, and you know me, my imagination just runs wild. I just wanted to see what it'd do. <laughs> anyway, welcome one time, one time for my people that are indigos, and two times for my people that are vegans. We are up to 14,000 listeners and 865,000 downloads worldwide, just as you're along. And we've been at it for three solid years. I appreciate all you guys who have been rocking with me on this journey. And we are still growing, baby. It is all because of you, almost definitely. We are the people who have dedicated their lives to music art and a research in every aspect and we want to allow you that opportunity to tell your story man we've had celebrities on the show from grammy award-winning artists to actors technology geniuses uh comedians from authors to professors aliens or people who think they're aliens it doesn't matter who you are or what walk of life that you come from come on my show and talk to me so check it out to book an interview or to uh, share a real cool story with me, just email it at vradio at onlyonemediagroup.com. I am passionate about what I do, just as passionate about what you do, and together, yes, together, we can get your voice heard by the people that should hear it. So let's create something incredible. And with that, hello out there, and welcome to another, I'm working on that, okay? Chill. Welcome to another episode of my podcast, Vigilantes Radio. You guys, thank you as always for tuning in and being a part of my audience family. If you like information on how to call in, ask questions, or speak to the guests, check this out. Skype in at houdini.black. That's W-H-O-D-I-N-I dot B-L-A-K. Or you, or you can hop in the mix directly from my website, which is only one media group. Dot com, And just scroll over to the Vigilantes Radio tab and there's a button that says call in, tap that and you're right in the mix. And that's probably the best connection that I can uh, think of. Alright, all episodes are available for free download as the show ends via the website. And again, that is only onemediagroup.com. And that goes for every single show that I've ever aired. Well, you guessed it. Tonight's episode is the Aaron Little interview, and I am your host, Danny Mussolini. All right, let's speed through the announcements. I really don't have too much to announce, except that I'm super excited about what you guys did for my uh, alternative band, or hip-hop band, or alternative band, No Longer the Hero. So we set a goal that we were going to reach 10,000 plays in two weeks and well we reached that today 
You guys are so incredible for supporting us. Uh, it really, really means a lot. I know thank you sound cliched, but when I tell you thank you, I really and truly and honestly mean that because there was once upon a time where I had no plays. Well, actually I did, but it was just me listening to the music over and over and over again, you know? Just trying to listen so I can fine-tune some things for the next record. But you guys have made my little dream come true. And I know to some of you bigger out there, 10 kids, not a lot, especially a two-weeks time period. But for me, a guy that's been on the bottom, that's a lot. And that means a lot to me. So, again, thank you um, to the supporters out there. If I could write you all a thank you note, I would most definitely do that. But since this is better and I could reach more people, thank you. Cool deal. Now, if you want to check the record out, it's over at audiomac.com. Um, the song is called On My Way. It's the remix we did with DJ Big Crack. Uh, of course, the original version is still on YouTube. I think it's sitting at right at 50,000. It's a cartoon, so that's probably why it got so many plays. But no, it's a real cool song. Um, real dark theme, because um, you know we like to sing about heartbreaks. That's the thing. Um, so yeah, it's a real cool record. Um, the remix is, is nice, I tell you very very nice so make sure you check that out uh it's also free download uh we're not too much worried about making any money from it so have at it read it. uh your songs if you like have a way with it i don't care as long as you listen that's that's all that matters to me um let's see i do have a show in new york uh i think january the third i think that's about right if I'm wrong, you can go over to sound or songkick.com, purchase your tickets from there. I know it'll tell you that I'm on tour, but I'm really not. I just did some spot dates between uh, August and now and January. So uh, that is the last date that's listed. But it's available if you want to come out and check it out. I, I can't remember the venue. I'm sorry, guys, but things are just running together with me. I'm going to get it together, I promise. Uh, thank you guys uh, that are in the chat room. I see you. So if you have questions later on, I'm definitely call on you guys first because you were here first. Well, let's see. Uh, there are a little over 8,000 live tonight with us. How are you guys doing? That's cool, man. Thank you. And I thank you. Yes, thank you. See, this would be the part where I shake your hands if we were like face to face. I'm not really a touchy guy, but I would touch you guys. I mean, not in a bad way, but you know, forget it. Okay. Um, any more announcements? N yes. On the 27th of this month, right in time for the holidays, I put together a project. Uh, I worked with uh, two Grammy Award winning artists on it. They're featured on the uh, project. Um, and the rest are people that you know or should know. Or that you would want to know after you listen. So I'm keeping the track list a secret. That's right. I'm doing it like the old days. You know when they used to flash the uh, albums on TV. And you just see the cover. You may hear like a clip or two. Yeah I took it back there. No track listing. So you guys will have to download it. Because it is free. Uh, for three months it will be free. And then I'll have to make a little piece from it. Like put it on iTunes. Oh no I'm going to stream it. Let's do Spotify. Pandora. That kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm not too worried about downloaded sales. But uh, Screams, that's where the money is right now. Or the half of the pennies, that's where that's at. So uh, that will be available on uh, December the 27th. I usually release music between 12 a.m. and 3 o'clock a.m. because I'm, I'm a vampire or night out or whatever you want to call it. That's usually when the creative artist works around those times. Yeah, weird. Um... Uh, just keep your ears and eyes tuned to OnlyOneMediaGroup.com. Um, it will appear on, appear on Datpiff and AudioMac. I tend to love our AudioMac, but that's where it will be first. I don't too much posting on Facebook about things dealing with uh, my music, but every now and then I may have time. Excuse me to do that. Um, and you can always check out the like page. It's R7 Worldwide. And the uh, probably listed there. So, yeah, get your hands on a collector's item because it features past, present, future remixes, unreleases, 
uh, new songs, old songs. It's real cool. I promise you. Like I was listening to it yesterday, and I didn't want to share it with you guys because I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. But since I'm generous, I will share it with you guys. It's incredible. All right, with that, that is all of my announcements. I promise I'm not going to bore you anymore with that. Uh, Coach Dini tip for tonight, and for you that are listening, what, what Coach Dini is, it's my uh, perspective on the music industry from my own point of view, from my own experience. Okay, um, back in, let's see, 2004, I interned for Russell Simmons over at Def Jam, and then a year later, I became the junior road manager. Yeah, that was fun. And so Fat Form folded. Def Jam, he sold his uh, parts to Def Jam Way, and I was out of a job. So I went home. Mississippi is where I'm from. I went home, and I opened up a artist management firm. And I started managing artists. Uh, funny thing, I started, my first uh, client was a guy from Ohio. Like, yeah, you open a firm in your own town and don't even <laughs> manage arts from your town. Yeah, yeah. So Ohio and then California, then I had a uh, girl from Europe. And then I got back into my own town. And then my biggest client came along, which was a Grammy Award winning artist at the time. And he still is, I guess, 50 million records sold. And, uh, yeah, after that, um, I started doing music myself. I mean, I have always done music, but... I always jump in and out because seasons change with me. I'm always doing something new. Okay. So along my little journey, I've learned some things. I've been signed up for. I've been broke. I've been homeless. I've been uh, living at large and been, you know, all that good stuff. But here I am now with all of this wisdom and knowledge that have helped me, you know, get to where I am. And uh, it may not be anywhere to, like, you big shocks out there. But to me, I, f I pay my dues with that way. So here it is. Coach Dini's tip for tonight is um, how to help your sales um, as far as uh, screaming goes. Yeah, maximize. You know how to maximize your, your release. You know, give it that full potential. And I'll just share three tonight. I have actually 10 and all so i'll spread those across my other podcasts as i do because i don't want to make the show all about you know how to be successful in the music business because that is actually my job now full-time coach Danny. you can go over to uh, well, let's get into that later anyway as musicians we know there's an overwhelming amount of work to do when you release your music it's like the most pressuring time ever and that's kind of the time i'm going through now because i have so much legal stuff i have to do is that you need to get it uh distribute it promote it market it heard and generating money for you um with all of the methods that m music is being discovered listened to shared and bought today i have about techniques that you can use to maximize revenue and sales and sometimes by adopting these, you can make the most out of how listeners use digital sales and streaming platforms. Um, so the first little tidbit, and like I said, this is, these are things that work for me. I, I can't say they may work for you, but just you know, keep an open mind. Number one, cover a well-known song. So most listeners of streaming services are customers of digital stores. Use the search bar to find music that they like. And they leverage this by recording. Uh, and Well, we can leverage this by recording a cover song of a well-known song. And this can boost your sales since people will often listen to different versions of the song that they're searching for. And if they like it, they often check out the rest of the music from that artist. So keep in mind that if you choose to do a cover, you need to clear the rights with the publisher. You can use services like Eason or Louder or even the uh, one and only the Harry Fox Agency. So that's something that I did uh, a few years back. I uh, covered a, uh, I can't remember the song now. But it was super popular at the time, and we put our mix on it. Uh, we were about to do another cover of Coldplay's God Put a Smile on Your Face. So that's going to be real cool. 
and we'll do the same technique. Um, number two, and this may not work for you, but it kind of happened to me by accident. So uh, you're not the type to record, you may not be the type to record cover songs. Another method to leverage how listeners use the search feature for digital stores and streaming service is to give your track a similar title to another well-known song or common phrase. And since um, song titles can't be copyrighted, you can do it legitimately uh, and name your song either Hello or Uptown Funk if it makes sense to. That way it comes up in searches and get discovered. So a, a few years back in 2008, I stumbled upon this technique by accident. I wrote a song called Turn It Up and I released it um, uh, through CD Baby actually. A few years later, <laughs> yeah, it took a few years, but a few years later, I noticed sales of my song for some reason, and it became the selling song in my album, and I had a filler song for me. And it took a while, but I tracked it down to a popular dance song that charted in Europe, which I said took years later because that song had just came out and was blowing up over in Europe. So the song like be backed off of people's searches for the dance song and it spiked my sales in the process because they listened to it and they like hey i actually like this too and i also also got fans out of the deal which is cool all right uh number three create striking cover art uh, with streaming services people often hear with their eyes first so browsing a uh, service or digital music store is as much visual experience as it is about the sound. And this is how I do, how I find artists that I'm looking for. There, I create playlists on Spotify, SoundCloud, and um, I'll say eight times out of ten, I do look at the cover art. And if it's interesting enough, I say, hey, the sound must be interesting too. Now, a lot of times I am fooled at that, but, yeah, you know, I'm still intrigued by the artwork first okay um a striking image can stand out can catch people's attention and make them click to sample the track so if you create an image or design that stands out next to the other tracks images on your page you'll improve chances of getting your music discovered screamed or purchased which one comes first so that is Coach Dini's tip for tonight on how to maximize your streaming if possible. Like I said, it worked for me. It may not work for you. Um, but it's worth the try, right? Right. So like what you hear, uh, Coach Dini is a service that I offer um, for my listeners and artists out there that are confused on where to go or what to do next. Or just uh, a professional outlook on their whole approach to their music. Um, give me a shout. Uh, the first 15 minutes are free. And then after that, there's a minimal fee that's very affordable. Um, you can always shoot me a text uh, via the website or email me from the website. And it will come right to me. There's nobody monitoring it. So I, I sometimes do um, answer all questions. But I do again, you should uh, book me. <laughs> I have to, right? You got to get paid. You got to pay the light bill and stuff like that cool stuff anyways so yeah i am available for that so um feel free to hit me up and there's a calendar widget there you can uh, just tag me right in the calendar and hey i'm yours for 15 minutes or if you want to go beyond 15 minutes that's fine with me too all right and all that is on only media group.com on the very front there's widgets that pop up right as you land on the page there's no music playing no videos no autoplay that stuff gets annoying because a lot of times i go to artist sites and you know they're forcing me to listen to a song i don't want to listen to or they have a video that automatically start playing you should give people a choice really you know anyway that's the tip for tonight so let's get into the real reason why you guys have stuck around since 10 o'clock and that is the Aaron Little interview. Let's go ahead and dive deep. By now, we can assume, if you've been following our show here from Vigilantes Radio, that you're well familiar with the fact that we've interviewed rock stars, Grammy winners, and music gods like Aaron Little. I've had the extreme pleasure of researching, getting to know this incredibly talented artist from a 
Ontario. Yes, Canada wins again. And I don't say that in vain. I say that because Canada is winning right now. And uh, if you'll head over to AaronLittleMusic.com, that's A-A-R-O-N-L-I-T-T-L-E-M-U-S-C-S-I-C.com, you'll find all of the goodies that I'm talking about on his website. And, of course, if you're in uh, the Canada area, uh, I'm not sure which actual region, but you've probably just seen him recently on Cha-Cha or Chicha or C-H-C-H local news channel. Uh, and we'll get that corrected from him when he gets on. Uh, you've seen him perform live with both bands, C-Spot Run, which I've uh, seen the videos, and Orange Man. Uh, you'll be able to see him live this weekend at Falls View Casino. A casino? That's like my dream to perform at a casino. He's a pretty big deal if you ask me. Maybe change his name from Aaron Big Deal or two. Yeah, change his name to Aaron Big Deal. Okay, guys, yeah, I screwed that up big time. Don't worry about it, though. His new album, It's About Time, will drop in August. Or it has already dropped in August. Yes, it has. It's, it's December now. Come on, Deanie, get with the times. Bro. Anyway, this has got to be an incredible and wild ride for this guy here. And in, in my duty to all of you out there, cleverly disguising my own needs to harass the incredibly talented indie music scene, as I always mentioned before, it seemed about time to talk to someone like Aaron and see what the experience of recording that pressurized album was like for him. I mean, there has to be stories, all right? So without any further ado, and I've been wanting to say that word for a long time, further ado, <laughs> let's welcome Aaron Little to our corner of the internet to discuss the latest album, It's About Time, and other things that I can just randomly think of. What's going on, Aaron? I, you know how boxers have the, the the call guy, the introducer that comes out and the, like, here's the greatest thing that you've ever seen, and this is why you paid your ticket. I want to hire you to be that guy for me because that last <laughs> three four minutes there, I've been just chuckling in the background the whole time. It's amazing. You should just keep doing this. Like, I'll just get you to record a couple of promos for me, and we'll go with that. Hey man, you got it. <laughs> yeah, the audience kind of clown me every now and then. They're well, begging me to get a new greeting or you know i say hello you know that kind of crap but you're an entertainer for me you're an entertainer it has to, it has <laughs> to be a thing right oh yeah so all right yeah so uh, Aaron. just to just to correct you quickly it is chch uh television in hamilton ontario and uh i don't too far from there uh, so they were very gracious to have me on there last week and uh, it was a really good experience to be able to play but i mean they they have an audience on that morning show of like uh probably 50 to 60,000 people every morning. So uh, I, was, I was very happy to be able to go on and, and uh, play the song that I did, which I have already posted on my YouTube page. So you can go and find that uh, all linked in through my website. Definitely. So you guys go over right now. No, right, not right now, after the interview. No, I don't care. <laughs> you guys are great. You can do what you want. But, yeah, I checked it out, man. It was cool. How do you handle that kind of pressure, man, with that kind of audience? That's massive to me. Um, well, in a situation like that, you've only got an audience of about five people, so it's really quite easy. As long as you're not thinking about the people on the other side of the camera, it's not a problem. Um, in the times that I've played for uh, larger audiences, where uh, like when I played with C-Spot Run uh, for all these years, uh, we've we've had some bigger shows that we did with uh, Stone Temple Pilots, and uh, Bon Jovi was the biggest one that we ever did, and um, you know that was twenty five, twenty six thousand people, I think, and it it isn't hard to do surprisingly which i've been asked a number of times like how do you get out and perform in front of people like that it's it, it's exciting to go up and play in front of that many people but at the same time they they're kind of from you you know and you'll know what i'm talking about when you, when you play the smaller clubs you're playing to five hundred thousand people they're there and and you can interact with them and you can reach out and you can touch them you can smile and you can make eye contact and when you're you're on a, a big stage with something like that you're like 30 40 feet at best you know, from all the people sitting in front of you. I mean, I'm I'm 25 feet from the drummer behind me. It's a very, I don't, I don't know, disengaging experience in some ways. You know, it's overwhelming by the people, but at the same time, it's they're so far. Yeah. Jeez. So, 
yeah, it's it's been fun. I've done stuff like that too, and that probably found very similar experience. That you know, playing to smaller groups of people tends to be more intimate and more fun than the than the larger groups of people. I'm not appreciative of it. Definitely. I told you guys he's a music god. Only gods can perform in front of audiences like that, right? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, if they knew how nerdy I actually was, they might not think that anymore. <laughs> Yeah. All right, Aaron. So tell us about <laughs> the reaction or what has the reaction been to the release of It's About Time? Did anything at all surprise you about how it was received? Um, uh, quite a few things, actually. Uh, you know, I've, I've been very good reaction so far, and it, it wasn't at all what I was expecting. I was sort of expecting it to be sort of a, a ho-hum, here's another album, here's another record kind of thing. Mm. Um, I called the album It's About Time because I've, I've been playing with C-Spot Run for so long and writing songs on the side, and we had a bunch of fans that were saying to me, you know, so when are you coming out with the record? Mm. Um, so when I actually was coming out with a record and telling people that I was going to do it, they all kept saying it's about time. And I was like, oh, that's actually not a bad title. So I kind of stuck with that. But then it was sort of a, a dual meaning thing because uh, the, the majority of the songs are all written about personal experiences and things that I went through in my life and, and just reactions, emotions, all you know, interpersonal kind of stuff. And so it is literally about time as well. It's literally about the last 10 to 12 years of my life and, and those experiences that have happened and what inspired me along the way in order to be able to write them. So, it, you know, as reaction goes, it's been a lot better than I was expecting it to be. You know, I've, I've been getting some very good press. Um, I, had, I had a good one on Paste uh, Mag, another one off of BuzzFeed that really surprised me. Um, and, you know, when you, when you start getting press back, you sort of sit there and think, okay, so I'm going to get two or three good ones, and there's going to be a couple that are going to be not so complimentary, and then there's going to be a few that are, are just sort of for the sake of passing it around. And then so far, every bit of press that I've gotten has not only been fantastic, it's been over-the-top fantastic. And at first, I was sort of cynical about that, thinking, okay, you know, they're just they're being paid you know, to, to go and write something really nice. Okay, complimentary. Okay, I should send them a thank you for a basket or something. But thank you. You know, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> but as it continued as a trend, I, I kind of went, okay, maybe, maybe I did something good. You know, maybe I actually did something that that people are enjoying the way that I think that they're enjoying it, and uh, you know, it's it's been a very pleasant reaction, a very pleasant thing to uh, to find the kind of response that I'm getting from fans and uh, you know, media and and other people alike, and I'm very appreciative of it. Definitely, and that's like one of the first things that I do when um when I get material on my desk about a, a new interview or a guest. As I look at the Google impressions, and that's all I seen when I Googled you, was all of these reviews and reps and press. I was like, okay, this, he's on a press run right now. You can tell he's blowing up Google, and it looks like it's massive to me, man. It looks great. It's a real look, real, real good look. Thank you. I know the sort of the hope is that just kind of get something going even before the album came out with the single. And then um, sort of follow it up and put the album out there and see what I could get. Uh, you know, I just recently been doing a, uh, a real push for university and college radio, uh, mm-hmm. which, as you know, is is something that you have to sort of build up in order to be able to have something going. And um, I, I'm surprised. Like I sent out emails and packages and so on to 68 different stations, and I've only had about four of them so far tell me no. Hmm. And wow. and so yeah, like out of 68. Uh, I've probably had about half that uh, I've called and followed up with now, and, and they've said that they're either adding a song or have added a couple of songs already. I've had a few stations that actually took three or four songs off the record oh, and wow. have, uh, have put it right into their rotation. So, you know, those are, to me, really good signs of, of how the album is actually doing. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, what was your role um, in C Spot Run? Uh, I was a guitar player um, who got the gig as um, uh, the guy before me that they had for the gig. Um, he sort of left at a very last notice with less than a week to go before their next show. And uh, he uh, got him up so quickly that they were caught off guard. So the was in the band is a friend of mine, and he called me and said, Hey, guitar player, you know, to sweet right now, get get your stuff. Can you, can you learn this many tunes in a week? And I went, uh, sure. And so I... I, I 
I picked up and uh, did the first show and they were impressed with me and I kind of kept going from there and um, I've been with them for a little over 10 years now uh, so I'm still playing with them now currently while I'm uh, still doing my own stuff and it's uh, it's kept quite busy but really my role is to be a guitarist to be a backup vocalist in the band um, to be a personality you know that's one of the things that I love about this band is that each individual has its own personality and their own uh, sort of character to them and um, you know so it's not just about the singer you know it's it's about a group image and a group interaction with each other and and even in public how we interact with each other and that makes it a lot more fun uh, as as the individual playing in the band and so I've gotten to to record with them do some pre-production uh, Chris Chris and Randy for the most part write the tunes but uh, Dave and I uh, take some uh, uh, musical leeway in the in the way that we go about performing and recording a lot of the songs and uh, it's made it a very interesting learning experience to play with them actually for the last 11 years all right, cool. And speaking of C-Spot Run, what do you feel that you learned from um, previous recording experience uh, or just a lot or, um, with, with the band, or is that just something that you perform live? Well, the, the band has done uh, five albums, and I've had the pleasure of recording on three of them so far. Um, and uh, those last three albums that I played on were a really interesting learning experience because... It, it one I didn't really know who the boys were right at the very beginning, but as the years have progressed, um, I've not only learned a lot about their approach to songwriting, uh, and, but also the recording process and the release process and so on. And, and that I think really helped me sort of fine tune what it is that I, that I needed to uh, sort of do in my own music as well, which was things like uh, you know finding complementary uh, complementary parts and melodies to fill in space. You know, like a, you can have your chords and you know, all your instruments and so on, but sometimes there needs to be like a secondary instrument that's doing another melody that sort of helps it bring everything up a little bit. Um, or even just how important the melody actually is to the song. I find a lot of instrumentalists who write songs typically are, are focusing on like a guitar part. You know, this is the key theme song, and then everything sort of revolves around that. And I, I always was sort of a a drawback to a lot of musicians' approach to to writing and playing music because most of their audience isn't an instrumentalist, so they wouldn't appreciate that the same way as they would as as a vocalist. All right, I can understand that. And and what did you learn from this current record that you feel will help you in recording your next album in the near future? Um, well, this album took me nearly three years to finish from the time that I, I really started working on it seriously um, and that was just because I, I wasn't really the direction that I wanted to go yet so I learned a lot about the recording process because I actually um, did a lot of recording at home uh, I have my own studio set up here at my home and uh, I've been using it for a while and it took me a little while even though I've been in studio a number of times to sort of learn how to use Pro Tools like the recording it, uh, program itself but then all the other instruments and so on that I could pull in from that. And I had, I had some good experiences um, over those years that really helped once I started getting into it because I started looking around and asking, okay, is there, is there somebody here that could get a hand with this? Is there somebody that could you know, kind of guide me in a direction? And one of the first guys that uh, was somebody that my, my uncle actually met while golfing, um, his name's uh, Louis Biancanello. He's a, um, a producer for Sony and a songwriter for Sony. And uh, one of the first albums that he worked on way back when was the Bodyguard soundtrack in the 90s. Mm. Uh, so, you can, you know, you can imagine the success, the success that that al album had, and he's been writing uh, music for a bunch of different people since then. And um, so when I was down in California for uh, the NAMM show, a uh, big convention going on down there, I, I, he put an offer out to me to drop by a studio for a day and sort of say hi, and maybe he could give you some tips on things. And that ended up being one of the best experiences I could have it came to the recording side of things where he showed me you know here's the traditional way of recording versus how realistically this is what the industry does now and it, it used to be a lot more complicated process where you had to have you know pre-production then you go and record all these different instruments your bed tracks and your bass then you throw in vocals and more guitars and blah 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 and synthesizers and all the things that you throw in there then you do the the, the mix down then you take it to mastering then you do, meanwhile he does pretty much everything there, you know, he does the full production of everything, including all the mastering and stuff in his studio, um, and the song is finished just with a different singer. 
So whoever they're pitching it for, like let's say they're pitching it for Kelly Clarkson, there'll be another girl singing on the song. They go and pitch it to Sony, and if Sony says yes, then Kelly Clarkson comes in and throws her vocals down, and the song is done. So I sort of took a very similar approach to, to trying to finish all the record and just say, okay, rather than going through multiple steps, let's just see if I can get every song as close to being finished as I can uh, right from the get-go. Right. And that that made it so that I knew what the final product would sound like and what it was missing and what it needed and so on. And I found um, that to be kind of enlightening, enlightening in some ways because by the time you're you're done the full sound, if you are missing something, you can go back and add stuff as opposed to the traditional way where you'd you know, you go and get it mastered, then you listen after and say, oh, it's kind of lacking, and then you go back in the studio and re-record things, and then you master it a second time, and it, you know, it's a back-and-forth process and a money-eater. And So he showed me how to really streamline that process, and I was very thankful for that. All right, cool. Um, how about any cool memories along the way of recording your uh, latest album, It's About Time? Um, one of the cooler memories that I, have, I should say isn't really necessarily like an interactive thing. It was actually the writing of a song called uh, Last Goodbye, um, which is a song about my last experience with an ex of mine. Um, and, uh, well, it, it sounds a lot sappier when you listen to it. Like, I feel a lot more upset about it than I am. Uh, you know, it was one of those songs that from the moment that I started writing it to the time that I felt it was 95% finished, recorded, and completely done, uh, was in total about six days, um, to which I was sort of surprised about, because I worked on took me nearly that much, that little amount of time. And I thought that that was kind of a cool sort of immersive thing, is that I, I sort of just started plucking out some, some guitar chords. I just, um, without really trying to think about what I was trying to say, I just started singing. Um, to those chords about that day and about the, the feelings that were coming across me that day. And by the end of the night, I had already um, written out all of the lyrics, decided on what the melody was going to be, and actually designed the full piano for the song uh, within 12 hours of me starting it. And uh, that that was sort of a surreal experience. It, it was definitely a, an eye-opener that also sort of helped me to understand that if I just sort of open up, relax, and just go with the flow of where I think the song is taking me, that the song should be a little bit simpler to write than maybe sort of the traditional way of doing it. Definitely. I think you stepped into your music godness. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> was it, was it, was there a glowing blue light or something around me? Like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I should go back and check the video. Yeah, man. All right, again, from my own experience, there are certain parts that go real slow, um, but most fly by so very quickly. And the next thing you know, everything is said and done. So did you actually have a chance to really take your time in creating this album and enjoy yourself along the way? Oh, absolutely. And, it, you know, a, a big theme of what it is that I tried doing with this album was sort of finishing a song. And then when the song was done, uh, put it aside for like three weeks and don't listen to it again or touch it or do anything. Um, and the reason that I did that was I found I was I was really quick to be excited about the first couple of songs that I finished and be like, yeah, here's something I did and here you go and try to share it with people. And they were like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and I went, what do you mean it's okay? This is so good. Look how much time and how much effort and how much you know enthusiasm. And I sort of realized, oh, uh, well, maybe that's just me. And so what I started doing was putting it aside for three weeks and trying to come back and listen to it without that enthusiasm there. And I, can, I could sort of with a, I don't know, sort of a different point of view. And um, that was one of the more helpful things and, 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 you know, first big learning curve, first big learning experience of, oh, okay, the energy and so on that I have about this isn't necessarily because the song is so good. It's also because, you know, I need to ref you know, it's because I'm I'm into it, so I just need to reflect on this stuff more. And I think that was where I really got to now sit and enjoy. Because when I come back to listen to it again, three weeks I'm down with fresh ears, I'm not letting anything else in the room influence me. I'm just listening to the song. And every single time I went, I like this. I know what I need to do. Like I know I'll adjust this to make it a little bit better. But, you know, I'm in, I'm enjoying this. I'm not regretting this. I'm not saying, Oh, everything sucks and I need to like some artist to 
you know, I, I felt confident. I felt good in what things were, and so it allowed me to appreciate the album as it was happening. And that's definitely different than the last uh, three records that I did with uh, C Spot Run. It was it was a much more cathartic experience. Okay, and um, let's discuss your up and coming tour plans, if any. Um, mm-hmm. I checked out your calendar. You seem to be busy every weekend this month. Um, and you remain to this day by far one of the most active independent artists I know of. So there must be more live music up. So tell us all about it. Well, I'm working on uh, a bit of a different show. Like uh, you mentioned the Orange Band thing which and uh, Rod, between those two bands, I, I keep very busy as it is right now uh, just because – you know, as you were saying, the lovely interview. We got to get brothers got to get paid. So I had to keep how in order to be able to uh, keep that thing going. But um, what I'm working on right now is a live show with uh, musicians like uh, Dave, who plays with me in C Spot, Ron here with me, and another uh, bassist named Ryan Storkson, who's a good friend of mine as well, and um, recently a piano player uh, uh, named uh, Matt that I've had really good experience with on CHCH with last week. So we're trying to put together sort of four-piece live show that we wouldn't do. Um, but then I'm also trying to put together sort of a visual element of the whole. Because one of the things that I find is lacking these days is, um, you know, not that I was certainly old enough to remember this kind of stuff, but I can watch all these videos of the 80s bands that were playing in the clubs and the bars and the circuits way back when. And they had a serious light show. They had mm. log, you know, like sometimes there was, uh, you know, backup singers and all kinds of stuff, even just in the, the regular bar bands. And I find that we've lost that element of it just by trying to simplify and get as many bands as we can in on a stage and a set for a night that sort of ruins that experience for the audience. And so they stop going out and they stop engaging with the, with the, the bands as much unless they're sort of like the, the super fan type. You know, if they're if they're not the super fan that goes out to see music three or four days a week, then they're probably not going to be drawn into what you're doing. And um, so I've been trying to talk to a buddy of mine, Chris, about the visual aspect going, getting uh, projection screens happening with some video happening in the background, um, getting some extra lights and little projections and stuff to happen on stage. So that even if I were to go up by myself and play, that there's sort of a visual element of the whole thing to draw people in. Um, I mean, I look at a guy like The Weeknd. Right. He goes up and sings by himself to tracks. That's his whole show. There's there's one dude, right? So how does that one dude encapsulate people? Like, there has to be, you know, he's he's got fantastic music, but there's got to be something else to it. Yeah. Working on trying to design that aspect, oh, that even if I was just to, um, for the sake, of simplic- the sake of simplicity and logistics, to travel around Ontario... And, and Quebec and so on do shows but now there's a visual element to the whole thing that I can take with me and uh, I think that'll be very important for most bands going forward that there has to be something more to the show something more to what they're doing to engage the non-fan because otherwise they're just going to look at you and say oh, just another band and they might not even hear the music so the quality of the music 